Welcome to Rates and Barrels. It's Thursday, March 14th. Derek Van Riper here with Eno Saris. On this episode, we have a big March trade. Dylan Cease on the move to San Diego. So we'll talk about the return that the White Sox got, the implications of the Padres, adding Dylan Cease to that rotation. Uh, we got an update on Devin Williams, and it's not good. We'll dig into that situation and the Brewers' bullpen. It will likely be a first-half absence or something close to it for the Brewers closer. And then we had a really insightful mailbag question about uh, swing decisions in the shadow zone. We're going to dig into that and a few other mailbag questions as well. So lots to cover over the course of the next hour. A couple reminders. The Discord is open and within the Discord. We are now on to Listener League number three. So be sure to click on that link if you have not signed up for our Listener League. It is a salary cap contest. There is no entry fee. It's a customized league made over at fan tracks, really cool features, being able to put that together. We're just making multiple leagues because it caps out at 200 entries. So we want to make sure that as many people who want to play can. The big thing here, prices are locked in already. We're not changing prices for guys who are hurt. And lock for the entire season is Tuesday night, the 19th at 10 o'clock Eastern. So we've got about five days, as I say this right now, to get those rosters in. No in-season maintenance, which is really cool. We'll see how everything plays out. Um, and I think it's funny because I started to go through the mental process of, you know, how do I want to attack this? How do I want to play this? And I'm worried. Here's the thing I'm thinking about, which is the only strategy thing we're going to talk about before the contest actually locks, because I think we want it to just happen. I think we have a lot of like-minded people playing this game and attacking it the same way. And I don't think attacking it the same way is going to be the most effective. Oh, but you just win. poisoned the, the well. Now we're all going to be like, oh, I'm going to do the other idea. And then we all switch to the other idea. <laughs> I just wanted to throw it out there because, I, I mean, so many of us like the same kinds of players. And But there's a, there's a you know, we have our biases towards certain things we've done. And so, honestly, I've been trying to keep my, like, sort of draft and hold bias on the table during the early part of these uh, podcasts because that's what I was drafting. Now I'm switching to, you know, I just had TGFBI and I'm going to do a main event. Those are teams with free agency. So those have slightly different. And so you're going to hear my bias shift a little bit. I mean, I think I'm just a human being that that's, that's where my focus is, you know? Um, and this one, I think the biggest thing I can tell anybody about any game is learn the rules. Like if you're playing Catan, if you're like, you know, they like learn the rules and, you're going to maybe lose the first couple of times. Just learn what works in that format, you know? And the last, I think the the sort of, the, that's 101. I think when you get to 201 and 301 courses in any given uh, setup, you start, you know, taking kind of weird looks at it. Punting, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> doing this, full this, a Labadini. What's a Labadini? Labadini's like the dog. Like, it's kind of Italian dog. But isn't it? But it's also a it's a it's a a type of approach. No, I think it's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a Larry Larry Labadini. I think had a strategy. I, I forget the actual strategy. It's, it's a like very ten dollar pitching staff strategy. or something. Yeah. You know? it was the Lima plan that was all uh, inexpensive starters. Yeah, um, the Sweeney plan. I think actually Mike Gianella brought that one up. That one is punting power. Like, there's some Whoa. wild old strategies out there. I think that goes back to four by four roto. Just uh, as an idea, like how long ago that strategy was hatched. Yeah, and There's awesome abstracts on that in the beginning of the forecast. Or if you want to dig into some of those old <laughs> plans in detail, because a lot of those don't get used anymore. But maybe, maybe something like that actually could be effective. I, I don't want to tip my hand. I don't want anyone to tip their hand about what they're going to do. But that was just the, the primary thought is I'm like, we're, we're all trying to solve this problem. Not all of us. Many of us are probably looking at this with the same kind of glasses on. And I've mm -hmm. got to try and work against that a little bit. How much? That is the ultimate question. But the link is in the Discord. Highly recommend you check it out if you haven't signed up for our Listener League yet. And a shout out again to Fantrax. The customization at Fantrax is awesome. Like I've known for, for years, their auction room is good. Their dynasty leagues are great because their player pool is so deep. But whatever mm -hmm. scoring categories you want, they've got just about every scouting, scoring category you could want. And the biggest thing for us was making sure we could all play in the same league together. Right? It's fun to have an overall contest where we're all in groups of 12 and 15, but this is just different. Like It's, it's like everyone is out there 
for themselves. I really like that aspect of this. Yeah, yeah, should be fun. Let's get to the news. Dylan Cease has been traded to the Padres. Nice return for the White Sox. At least the more I've looked at it, the more I've come around to liking it. Uh, Drew Thorpe, who was not a Padre for very long, going to the White Sox in this trade. Jairo Iriarte, Samuel Zavala, and Steven Wilson, I believe the only major leaguer involved, current major leaguer involved in the trade, all going back to the White Sox. And this is, we'll start on the Padre side. This is pretty interesting given that they were seemingly shedding the payroll, making the Juan Soto trade earlier this winter, kind of pulling back from the hyper-aggressive approach that A.J. Preller in that front office had employed for the last couple of seasons. It's clearly not over because this is a team with a starting five that's really good. Their top four, with the addition of Cease, is Musgrove, Darvish, Cease, Michael King. And now you're only relying on one of Brito, Vasquez, Waldron, or the prospects to be your five. That's a good rotation. That's a playoff-caliber rotation. More questions now focus on, are they going to score enough runs? Those those questions will be answered in time. But Dylan Cease, how much does his value change for you leaving the White Sox and going to a Padres team that at least has playoff aspirations this year, even if they don't make it? I think the park factor is in his favor, in Dylan Cease's favor. That's a good one. I think it might be neutralized by some superior opponents. And... Um, like how many times do you want to start Dylan Cease against the Dodgers is going to be sort of an open question mark for his owners. I, I he's still firmly in the like 75, 90% bucket where you're going to start him most times. And I think personally, I will buy Dylan Cease and start him against the Dodgers. <laughs> like I think he's that kind of pitcher. So I'm all in. There's been a lot of sort of uh, grousing about his velo being down and his stuff being down, but I would say this, if you had a guy who threw 100 and had the best stuff in baseball and his velo was down and his stuff was down the next year, would you not want him? Um, so for me, uh, Dylan sees, you know, still top, he's the, he was the 12th in stuff plus among 100, 100 plus innings last year. Uh, his, his velo was down to 95.6. I mean, that's still really good velo for a starting pitcher. You know, there's a lot of guys... The average is is uh, for starting pitchers is ninety three five, so to be still two ticks above average is still is still good. There's I yes I think there's things he can improve and obviously his command isn't good, but you know the good news is command isn't super sticky year to year, uh, and he's going to a really good. I mean he had a good pitching coach, but he's going to another good pitching coach, one that I really respect in Ruben Niebla, and then the park is just going to clean up. Why do you hate command? Like why do you hate bad command? A lot of times it's because. It gets spanked. Well, the park, if the park cleans up some of that, you know, like why did is Joe Boyle going to have like a better chance of making it in Oakland than he was in Cincinnati? Because the mistakes are not going to be as painful. Um, and so I think just the mistakes in San Diego are not going to be as painful. I think Dylan C is going to have a great year. I think this is a great. My first reaction to this was amazing. Padres cleaned house like this is a, this is one of I think Preller's had some really really good trades and I was I was ready to put this in the sort of upper end of that I think the 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 only trade that's that was a little tough was the original Soto trade just because he gave up a starting shortstop that looks really good and James Wood looks pretty good so like he gave up that was the that was the most he gave up in the other trades the Snell trade was slam dunk you know for the Padres. Uh, I think the Darvish trade was pretty good. Uh, you know, there's a lot of the Clevenger trade wasn't great just because of the Clevenger return, but I don't, I don't know. I guess they gave up, they gave up Joey Cantillo in that trade. That must sound right. Yeah. Cause I, I was like, why is Joey Cantillo on the guardians? Um, but <laughs> so uh, I, I think the Prellers had a pretty good track record on trades. And if you just, if you say we have no more money, so it's either Soto and we have no pitching and it's all, rookies you know or you trade soto and you make your best of it i think he did a good job like you know given financial given these financial requirements i you we can argue all day if those financial requirements are legit or not you know like i understand sure, yeah. that part but let's say they are and he was given this mandate i think he did a good job the more i looked at and the part of this is drew thorpe's velo is down yeah. I mean, he was 92. He wasn't a great velo guy to begin with, but he was 92 plus 
when he was traded uh, midseason last year or, you know, from the Yankees. Um, like he was 92 plus for the Yankees last year in the minor leagues. He would, he, I've got this uh, tweet here from James E. Clark, um, a credentialed uh, writer for uh, the East Valley, uh, East Village Times in, in San Diego, saying he's struggling to hit 90 miles an hour. And that was two days ago. Whatever you think of him, like change up first is not always my favorite type of pitcher. Uh, maybe you like the plane, but it's it's a it's high vert from a high release point, so that's a little bit more predictable. You know what I mean? Like what mm-hmm. we really like are like the striders who get like good vert from low release points. So the batter's like, I don't understand. This is more like, oh, I see this guy coming. You know, he's high, he's over the top. Okay, it's gonna have vert. Um, but if it's ninety, you know, it reduces his 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 possibilities and. We're not sure about the breaking balls. You know, we're sure about the changeup, elite changeup, but we're not sure about the breaking balls. And we've seen plenty of guys struggle like a Gossman. Like, okay, if he ends up Gossman, then, you know, I'm wrong. But like we've seen guys with great changeups struggle to add breaking balls and end up in the pen or just end up sort of backhand pitchers. And so my initial reaction was, you know, bully for you, probably you just nailed that one. Um, but then I looked a little bit more at Jairo Iriarte and uh, the Savala. And I still think Preller had to give those guys up because his his butt is on the line in the next couple of years. He's got to do something. I think this is year 10 of AJ Preller, and they're projected to be like an 83 win team. You know, <laughs> so, um, you know, there's he had some fire under his butt and he gave up two 18 year olds for the White Sox. You're on year one as Chris gets, right? And this is the first time that Chris gets, I think, went and got some high variance youngsters, 18 year olds that could turn into stars. In the other trades, he's gotten guys like Braden Shoemake, which is like, well, we don't have a shortstop for AAA. So, right. Yeah. Maybe this guy will play <laughs> shortstop for part of a season for us, but it's not a long term solution. You know, I think, yeah, that's I, have, the I have not been impressed part. by Getz's first trades. So, I'm going to say, I, I don't want to weasel out and say it's a win for both, I, but I, um, I'm going to give a higher grade to the Padres. But I was, my first initial thought was if I was writing the trade grade piece, I'm giving an A. Uh, to uh, to Preller and like a B minus C plus to to Getz, but I think that's fair. I, I might make it a little bit smaller and be like A minus B. I'm looking at the Picota projections right now, and they have not rerun for today. I assume we're still looking at the preseason number here because they're projected. Uh, the Padres are at a 26.3 percent chance of making the playoffs. I think the Fangraphs ones may have rerun already. Because they're up to forty one point nine percent, and I think that's a pretty reasonable worth adjustment. It, that's also worth making that trade, right? Yeah, to get from a one in four chance to closer to a one in two. I wonder if if the situation is as tight as the finances are with the Padres is still such that if you get to the trade deadline and your team is clearly in contention for a playoff spot, if you can go out and find ways to add a little bit more, they still have plenty of prospects. That's part of the reason why I think it's so easy to like the Padre side of it, is that the top shelf guys in that system are all still there. You Mm -hmm. could use one of those guys later to go get a big piece at the deadline if you need to, or some of those guys might even be contributing for your roster. They could be the guys that help put you over the top as well. Are you buying the... I've always thought they were similar because of the strikeout and walk rates and then the variance from year to year in their performance. Are you buying the the comps that people are throwing out there now, like Cease and Snell, that they are actually very similar, although they do it with different hands? Yeah. I, yeah. Some people like brought that up like that's a big deal. Uh, I don't know. You're a starting pitcher. If you've demonstrated some success, how much does it matter? You know what I mean? Like it matters a lot for like your first year in the league. One's a righty, one's a lefty. Oh my God, like better figure out those platoon splits. <laughs> sure. <laughs> That's just sure. like established. I, I think they're very much the same pitcher. <laughs> they're the same guy. And the difference is that Cease is under contract for $8 million this, this coming season. And the Padres probably are not in the pro in the process of giving Snell an offer. Right. I, I would say they're almost certainly not in that position right <laughs> yeah. now based on. But if you're the right Yankees now. and you're the Giants, you know, maybe the Giants maybe are, just, are 
just two months now. late. They should have done this prospects. two months ago. Yeah. But the other question I have for you about this trade is how much do we look at the current White Sox front office and player development system? Brian Bannister heading up the pitching development. Do we have faith that they can take young arms, especially someone like Iriarte, who's weakness is command right you see it in the walk rate you see it in the scouting grades do we trust that they're going to take a lot of it and they seem to be targeting guys that have some command issues because that's where you can get pitching oh for to grow <laughs> right how many of these of these guys can they turn into high quality big leaguers the floor for most of these guys automatically is high leverage reliever but you have to be able to turn some of these guys into starters right. to make this rebuild actually work so do you think with Brian Bannister at the helm and the new kind of organizational player development approach they might be taking under Getz. I know White Sox fans are like, it's the same. Getz was here before. It's a little different. Do you think they're at least headed in the right direction? Do you trust they can get enough development right to make these trades worthwhile? Yeah, it reminds me of the J.J. Piccolo situation where you're like, well, he yeah. was there before, but he's not the same as the last guy. <laughs> no, there's, yeah. there's different. Uh, yeah, there are similarities. There are differences when their internal promotions are still changes, even though it's not radical change. Yeah. And sometimes they can be good at helping you sort of sort through what's there because they know what's there. And now they're empowered to kind of make more decisions maybe about hiring and firing. Um, but I, like, like, for example, Brian, Brian Bannister was not there before. You know, so there, there's a complete, there's a change, and that's something you can point to. And Brian Bannister is obviously going to know about something like the raise one target approach, you know, and he's he's obviously going to know even more advanced techniques possibly for for training um, command. All I will say as a small aside, um, I think maybe the best way to train command is the oldest one in the book. It's called the nine pocket, you know, net, you know. And it's just basically a net that you can throw into that has nine pockets. Like a telephone, like buttons in the telephone. Yeah. <laughs> the way the strike zone is labeled. Got, yeah, yeah. Just got those nine zones and you just try to throw it in one. <laughs> you know, mm. that, that's that's the best thing we've had. Although I guess there are more advanced techniques when you start talking about biomechanics and you start being like, how can we clean this up? Can we shorten up your arm path? Can we do this or that? Um, but I doubt that Bannister has full access to those in year one. You know, like right. some of those things, you need to build a pitching lab. You need to have edutronics. If you don't even have edutronics everywhere, like, what are you going to do? <laughs> like, you have to first, you have to install that. So I, I don't know if year one, you know, they're going to be able to do all this um, because my experience is, you know, from talking to analytics guys and people that have done this is sometimes you get to a situation where the first three years are just holy crap. Like they didn't do what we don't have. What can we do that first? <laughs> you know? Can we get so, some machines and plug them in? Yeah. Can we plug them in? <laughs> can we, can we actually collect the data off these machines or just look at them? <laughs> do we have people to process it or do we just collect it? Yeah, exactly. So I think there's some of that going on right now uh, in Chicago. So uh, like, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say like, Oh, Steven Wilson's going to go there and be totally different. I think they got no. Stephen Wilson because he, he's an okay reliever and he might actually be their closer. You know, like, I think Brebbia is even hurt. Healthy John Brebbia is more interesting than I previously give him credit for. But That too, uh, I was looking at him. But it I, is a little yeah. bit of a slider thing where his slider is better than his four seam. Right. So you get into that like Sergio Romo place where you're like, I would rather have someone with a better fastball in there. What if he throws multiple sliders, though? Hmm? Uh, yeah. We talked about this. Yeah, Still, I, I think I think people would rather have big fastball stuff in, in their closer spot, and uh, and I, I think that's like Baroa or or leisure. Oh yeah, but yeah, yeah. That's more. Is it, like, is it leisure or leisure? <laughs> I just say that way because I love. Uh, 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 what's the. Uh, uh, oh, I know the bit. And I'm blanking on it. The it's, Scottish, the, the uh, train, train spotting. 
Yeah. In a word, pleasure. My pleasure in your letter. <laughs> That's a bad Scottish accent. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, not great. Uh, we're stepping on new rakes on rates and barrels this year. We're not stepping on the old ones. That's, that's the thing that I'd like to emphasize to everybody. Like that's the that's the main goal for the season. New year, new rakes. No, I forget where we started with this. Oh, uh, yeah, Bannister, the similarities. Well, the similarities well, between Snell and Ariarte. Yeah, yeah they're gonna Ariarte, get it right. Like, I think Ariarte. You know, it's it's about sort of refining, refining it, and and maybe dialing in that changeup. I think his his fastball slider is ahead of his changeup, um, but you can also just turf the changeup and say, hey, what about the two breaking ball approach or three breaking ball approach? Do you have that much feel for spin? You know, so the, Iriarte is like a and some nice clay to mold, and then Savala is like a eighteen year old center fielder in a ball that could go a million different directions. Yeah, I think the player outlook I read over at Rotowire dropped an Ian Happ kind of floor sort of comp on him. That's a nice player. Like if that's if that's what you get in the long run, you're happy and you could get more. He's so young. There's still some projectability there too. Uh, probably the most interesting player from a keeper or dynasty perspective in the deal right now, given the distance Iriarte is away from the big leagues. Not by a mile, but I think Zavala would be the one I'd be most interested in trying to stash away. I'm a little bit more skeptical about Thorpe. I was more positive about Thorpe when he was traded uh, the first the first time, but since I've learned more about his release point and his velo, and I'm a little bit more negative on him now. Understandable. I, I think I have taken this new terrible philosophy, probably terrible philosophy, again, stepping on new rakes, I am increasingly skeptical of the information that comes out of spring training, not because not because I don't want the information, but because weird stuff happens, like the calibration of, of cameras and things that measure the information we're looking at. I'm skeptical that that's all done with the accuracy that we get from the big leagues throughout the season. That is all. So. It's a concern for sure with Thorpe. I think his value has a slight down arrow next to it on a lot of prospect lists, and it makes sense given all the reasons that you outlined. But great trade with the Padres could be a nice one actually for the White Sox, and that has not been the case for every trade we've talked about so far in the Chris Getz era. Let's get to a March injury, mm -hmm. yet another March injury. Devin Williams out at least three months. And it's a combination of fractures, two stress fractures in his back. He had a back injury at the end of last season. He was still having some soreness this spring. Uh, got checked out. Got a second opinion from Dr. Robert Watkins in Los Angeles. He confirmed the two stress fractures. The good news is the expectation that was in the, the Jeff Passan tweets about this is that he will make a full recovery. This won't be necessarily a long-term sort of problem, but it's kind of like a six-week rest period before like about six weeks of trying to ramp back up. There's also, though, a, a question of how it happened because stress fractures are usually uh, – you get a stress reaction and then you get a stress fracture, which means mm -hmm. that there's some sort of repeated, repeated stress on that area that – led to the stress fracture it's like we don't have any evidence that he like fell or anything right it's no like, no nothing like a, that it's a repeated pitching motion which it's kind a little of makes bit sense like given that it was garbage was having on his on the tip of his elbow it's like a stress reaction yeah it, it just it makes sense since it was a problem at the end of last season and then it kind of cropped back up that that's where that longer term oh yeah this has been kind of building up for a while it's it also that uh trevor may timeline yeah, he's talking about like, uh, you know, back hurts still going to sit uh, sit on it for a couple more weeks. Uh, reported to spring. Dang, back hurts still. All right, <laughs> let's go get an MRI. Somebody was I forget who tweeted. I just saw it fly by, but it was like, do players not go to doctors during the off season? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, some some do. Some don't. Would have been nice if he'd gone two, three months ago. He'd, he'd be nearing the end of his rehab now. So, yeah, yeah uh, tough. Tough break. So the, the questions on this one are kind of like, what are the implications for the closer pool as a whole? Does everyone just kind of move up a seat? Uh, does someone like Jordan Romano, who we've talked about as undervalued, end up getting nudged up around along with everybody kind of in the couple Probably. seats behind Williams? Like, I assume that's what happens. Like this, people just chase a little harder at the, the next part of the tier. And then the bigger question is like, who closes for the Brewers? Because... Among the candidates that you see people speculating about, Yoel Piamps, Abner Uribe, Trevor McGill. Those are the three names most people throw out there. I think those are the correct three names. 
it's three. And when you start breaking them down, it's not necessarily easy to point to one and say, that's the guy. Piamps by usage was frequently used in the eighth inning last season. Mm-hmm. Tie games, games where they were leading, high leverage. Uh, of of the final two months of the season, his performance kind of tailed off. He still had the highest leverage index of these three relievers, even though his results by strikeouts to walks and ERA, they were the worst. Like skills wise, you'd look at Pi Amps late in the year and say, hmm, heavy usage. Maybe he faded. Maybe the stuff wasn't as crisp. Maybe they don't trusting him. They're not going to trust him as much in 2024 as they did in 2023 because there were some diminishing returns and some of the tweaks possibly. With Uribe, you see the guy that is the capital C closer of the long-term future. It doesn't mean he's necessarily the guy right now. The skills flaw for me is the control, right? If you look Mm -hmm. at his last two months, 31 to 16 strikeout to walk ratio in 24 innings, no homers allowed, better leverage index than Trevor McGill. So he was in some tight spots. He picked up a save in extra innings. I think it was either a game where Williams pitched the ninth, like a tie game, or Williams wasn't available. I remember watching that game, but... Don't remember exactly how Uribe got the chance. So you could you could make a case for him. And given both Hayter and Williams walk related problems, it doesn't seem like the organization disqualifies guys from closing because of an elevated walk rate. So he's absolutely in play. And then there's McGill, who really jumps off the page by performance. 28 to 5 strikeout to walk in his last 17 innings over those final two months, one homer allowed. Lowest leverage index was coming in pretty early in the game relatively speaking. So how do you balance all that plus other factors like arbitration and cost control and uh, a new manager in Pat Murphy? Like It's one of those situations. Well, yeah, Pat Murphy's been the bench coach for Craig Council for a long time, so maybe it's the same. Or maybe he's in the boss chair and he wants to do things his own way. It could be, it could be a committee for the first time. Uh, where are you leaning right now on this one? Yeah, the manager effect is, a, is an interesting one. Is he... You know, he seems kind of a little bit more old school than council. And so I guess that if I'm sort of divining and you got my divining rod out, then I might say pie amps because that's like goes towards inertia and experience. Um, I just think pie amps is the worst pitcher of the three in terms of stuff. Plus, he's the worst pitcher of the three. And then you just look at his career strikeout rates. Last year was the first time he had an above average strikeout rate as a reliever. So. That just sort of screams to me regression. This spring, um, he's done fine by strikeouts with three strikeouts and two and two-thirds innings, but he has fewer innings than the other two, Hmm. which says something to me. You know, they haven't been rushing to get him out there. You know, Avner Uribe has four and a third, and uh, McGill has four. That's that's significant. That means that even if Piamps went out and threw an inning today, he wouldn't catch up. Um. And so, you know, I think McGill is my guy because I think Uribe is a little bit green. There's the command issue. Um, he's also further away from arbitration, so you could keep him cheaper longer maybe if that is a, is a concern. Uh, McGill was highlighted by Petriello, Mike Petriello, as a, as a guy who's going to break out and um, has great stuff and it seems like closer stuff. In terms of, you know, best fastball of the three, it might be McGill's. Like he's 98, 99. He's got that fastball I'm looking for from a closer. So McGill's my guy. I think that's where I'm going outside of keeper and dynasty leagues. I've been pushing for Uribe as a longer term stash. It's very hard to do it in a lot of leagues unless it's a really, really deep rosters. So keep that in mind too. Like stashing closers for future years, very dangerous game. They also break a lot. Um, so there's right. a ton of factors there. But I think I'm with you on McGill. I, I just it, the main thing for me is that Piamps was not the same guy at the end of the season that he was at the beginning. If he mm-hmm. was start to finish as good as he was those first three and a half, four months, I think he'd have that inside track. Your point about Murphy is like, yeah, I, mean, I think he's a little old school. He was head coach at ASU, geez, probably 10, 12 years ago now. It's been a little Does while. Does old mean old school? <laughs> <laughs> but he's he's interesting. The more I, I kind of hear clips from him and 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 try to learn about him from afar. Like he's quirky. He tries mm-hmm. to give everybody nicknames. He had the bagel in his, his slider shorts for a while. Yeah, that whole that thing. Was... He's he's kind of a goofy like old school guy. So there, yeah. there's it, it's really hard. It's, it's not going to be a like, on him. Uh, like uh, it's not going to be like a shave your shave your you know uh, face and you know say sir kind no, of no. that kind of old school. <laughs> I, I didn't 
I was, I was hoping you were staying above the shoulders for the shaving. I'm glad, <laughs> I'm glad that's where that was. Um, but it, yeah, I don't think he's like a Mike Schilt completely, uh, but mm-hmm. he's, he's kind of just unique in his own way. I just don't know if we, if we can really even read much into it. It's more of a, let's just see what happens and that'll inform us the next time this possibly happens. But I'm with you on McGill for this combination of reasons. I don't think you're dumb if you draft any one of the three if they're all going reasonably late. I think the uncertainty creates opportunities. If they don't make an announcement, if they don't tip their hand with some kind of usage pattern, which is hard to do in spring training, it's kind of just a, an open guess at this point. That's why you're going to get so many people saying, yeah, they're all kind of interesting, but I like this guy. That's mm-hmm. that's going to be the common refrain for the Brewers' bullpen. A couple really quick injury updates. I saw Ronald Acuna Jr. in the lineup to DH on Thursday. That's great news, given that we're two weeks away from opening day. I think that gives you every every indication you could want, at least at this point, that things are on track for him with that little scare we had with his knee. Um, the other injury we haven't talked a lot about on the show is Tommy Edmond. He's been shut down with some lingering wrist pain. He had surgery in the offseason. No activity probably for a week, maybe a little longer. It really seems like the door is opening for Victor Scott, if not for opening day, for an opportunity maybe a little bit sooner than expected as a result of, of Edmund having a difficult time getting over this injury. Yeah. Um, he's also having a great spring, which, you know, that was a that's a thing I've been asking managers and heard people ask managers very often over my 10 plus years of going to spring training is how are you making this decision? And I think increasingly actually over time, it's been, well, we have to, it's the whole body of work. It's, you know, we have to look at, and I even heard the Royals manager say, you know, what he's projected to do. So, you know, he was talking about projections and, you know, age and what he experienced, where he's been, what he's done. Um, all these things kind of uh, roll into it. But Victor Scott was at the AFL, you know, like that's finishing school. The, the whole idea of, go, of sending a guy to uh, the AFL is often just to see, like, can you handle, you know, 600 plate appearances? Can you get, can you be ready for that? And what we have from last year is 618 uh, plate appearances without the AFL. So he did a full season and half of it was a double A and he was 20% better than league average at double A and he's killing it this spring. Victor Scott, like what's your, like if we had a number, we should have like a, like a rating, like a little, you know, like, like 50% to make the roster. Like he's past 50% to make the roster. I like, will only uh, make the graphic if the needle wobbles a little, it even though to, it's in reflection. It has to, sh- has to be shaking. 65, 69. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not and marking just from, that. But where, what, no, seriously, like where, where is your, where, where is your percentage to make opening day for Victor Scott? It's got to be at least in the 40% range right now mm, because of the needs. Because playing, Playing center field is important, and I, I wonder how much they trust other guys. Plus, Newt Bar's banged up too. So yeah, like, I think it's over fifty. I think we're getting close to sixty. I, I, here's the other question, though, with Victor Scott. Like, okay, so somewhere in the forty to sixty range, like, and trending in the right direction. Why is his projection so bad? Is it the <laughs> absence of numbers at AAA? It's it's like he's not even close to league average from any of the projection systems, really even though yeah. he's 15% or better at low A, high A, and double A to this point in his career. I wonder if they make adjustments to uh, slugging and ISO numbers based on speed. Like if they downwardly adjust, you know, slugging projections. Um, because, you know, he had a 450 slugging at double A last year. Oh, that's only a 128 ISO because he had such a big high batting average, Scott did. And then he had 44 stolen bases. He had over nine, uh, over 100 when you count the AFL. Um, I wonder if there's like if they're like, well, that's not a slugging ISO. You know, that's not a slugging slugging. You know, that's a that's a running slugging um, because they all most of the projection systems have a sub 100 ISO for him. Uh, but I was impressed when I talked to the AFL. He was talking about you know improving his bat speed over the. Over the um, over the summer and having bat speed and launch angle um, 
uh, benchmarks that were given to him by the organization that he was trying to meet with his blast motion sensor. So I, I, I kind of think this is a guy who might surprise with power, maybe not in year one uh, at 23, but, you know, I could see him having a peak season with, you know, 15 plus homers. Um, so I, I like Victor Scott. I think uh, this is a good player. And even if he is just a, a Ruiz and we don't have batted ball velos, so it's kind of hard to tell uh, if he's more history Ruiz or, or somebody or, or Tommy Edmund who had a little bit of pop, you know, um, even if he is just an all speed guy, uh, it is the opportunity to maybe beef up your speed if you came out of your, your uh, draft low on speed. Yeah, and I'm much more likely to throw the very late dart at someone like Victor Scott than try to even go where Estrella Ruiz was going last year. You know, pick 200 range was the ADP for Ruiz in, in 2023. Scott's freer than that. Scott's like a, a bench pick, probably yeah. 350, 400, even with a little bit of the spring helium that he's likely catching right now. So, yeah, pretty interesting situation for the cards with uh, Edmund still having those wrist issues. And then, of course, the rib problem that Lars Nupar came into over the course of spring training. Let's get to uh, one of the big topics here today. And we had a mailbag question from Brendan. Brendan wrote, recent discussions about using zone minus chase percentage and the Seeger metric to evaluate plate discipline are very interesting. I was thinking about similar things last winter. I ended up training my own simple model to evaluate swing decisions. My question is about swing decisions in the shadow region straddling the edges of the zone. These pitches are hard to hit, but also have a decent probability of being called strikes when taken. These are locations the pitcher wants to execute in. Recent discussions on Vlad Jr. suggest that he's making too much weak contact with these pitches, while someone like Corey Seager is also aggressive in these locations and yet is being considered the model of good plate discipline. Given a player with good strike zone judgment, would you rather that player be aggressive in the shadows to maximize swings in the heart or be more discretionary in the shadows and lose out on a few middle-middle swings? How much does it depend on contact and barrel ability? I think my model says the latter is better, especially given it is correlated with chasing less, but I'm curious to hear any related thoughts or analyses. Yes, the, your slugging ability is key here, I think, because we ran some numbers and we, and we looked at some of the available research. First off, swinging the heart is really good. Uh, this is the heart of the zone. This is, you know, it's basically middle, middle, it's expanded a little bit, but it's middle, middle. Um, you know, all the numbers are great there. And, um, you know, we have a reader, Dominic, um, it's D O M I N I K K 85 on Twitter. Um, oh no, it's D O M I N I K K E U L is his Twitter handle. On Twitter, um, he uh, found that batters who swung, uh, like the batters who swung the most at the heart, um, and had uh, had like a decent ISO. See, always has a sort of do you have power component to it. Mm -hmm. um, the people that swung forty five percent or more at in the heart had a one thirteen WRC plus. People who swung under thirty five percent had a ninety seven WRC plus. Uh, so there is such a thing as too passive in the heart of the zone because if you have barrel ability, you should be swinging at those pitches. So we do like swinging at the heart of the zone. Now we're looking at the shadow zone. Shadow zone is that gray area. The strike zone is the green box if you're if you're looking on YouTube right now. Um, and the shadow area, shadow zone straddles that strike zone. It's generally where pitchers want to pitch. If you look at any location plus model, any location model, they're rewarding pitchers points for being able to pitch in these areas. It changes a little bit by count, by pitch type, but that's generally where they want to be. Now, we then looked at, um, at called strikes. So if a batter doesn't swing at those pitches, uh, they are called strikes 49% of the time in non-two strike counts. 49% of the time. So basically it's 50-50 if you let it go that it's a ball or strike. What really surprised me, and I did this because we had this back and forth when we got on here, this is what a batter is doing on balls, a non-two-strike pitches in the shadow zone. 314 batting average, 365 OBP, 492 slugging. 
Now we took out two strike counts, so two strike counts would reduce all those numbers. Massively favoring the pitcher there, yeah. You yeah. get breaking balls and stuff. But before you get to a two strike count, and the reason that we wanted to separate out two strike counts is two strike counts, you're battling. You should probably swing at shadow zone because the 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 that 50 50 thing that the, you're 50 percent out right yes the you know, cost the cost of of not not doing good there is worse than not doing good earlier in the count yeah it's not just a ball or a strike you know it's not just like count leverage that you're losing you're you're out you know in two strike counts so you should swing in two strike counts and then you're prioritizing contact over power and we're talking two strike approaches but before two strikes it looks like I guess you should swing, <laughs> especially I think if you can access that 495, that 495 slugging. If you can do that or better, I mean you're doing pretty good. A 390, like a a 360 OBP is like what you're saying is if I take it, I have a 50 50 chance striker ball. If I swing at it, I have a 37 percent chance of getting on base. Getting on base is better than getting count leverage. But I have a lower chance of it. You know, I have a 51% chance of a ball, but I have a 37% chance of just getting on base. I don't know. Those numbers are getting close enough. Here's a one last thing that muddies the water a little bit. Is Tom Tango's overall look at the value of swings and takes. And so what we have on the x-axis here is run values on, on swings and takes. And then um, on the Y, oh no, on the X axis is run value on swings. On the Y axis is run value on takes. And what you see is not many people have a uh, have a good run value on swings. In fact, just if you're looking at this graph right now, do you see where zero is on run value for swings? It's all the way on the right side of the graph. So like 80% of the history of baseball has had negative uh, run values on swings. <laughs> yeah it's like or 90 percent. i mean it's amazing the only ones that had positive run values on on swings were like juan gonzalez and todd helton and manny ramirez and alex like elite Rodriguez elite hitters like it, it's Mary true, true yeah. truly like elite hitters because everybody hitting else is hard yeah yeah so everybody else had a had a harder time on those so um, I would say you know, I'm a bias going into this. I was a little surprised by the numbers on what batters do um, in non two strike counts in the shadow zone. My overall bias going in was saying swing in the heart is good. I don't want to swing in the shadow because I, I think swings generally are, are too much. So, um, and that's, and that comes out of Tom Tango thing. That's my overall bias going in. I was a little surprised about how well batters do on non two strike pitches in the shadow zone. I love how Barry Bonds is basically a chart breaker on that one. Just <laughs> Way up off the top. screen, Who, top that? right corner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, just floating right off the screen. <laughs> I the the question, the original question made me think that maybe there's more value in swinging at shadow zone pitches if you're good. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> that was, that was kind of what I thought. I was like, okay, that's that's so, slugging part, you know. So, like, what do I want to see? Like, maybe I want to see barrels in the shadow zone like who's still hitting the ball hard in the right angles when they're hitting stuff that's not in the heart of the plate and so i just ran that simple search and it spits out a list of pretty much all good players like if you're getting a lot of barrels and you're doing that from the shadow zone you're probably good that leaderboard just for anyone who cares austin riley most in the league last mm. year 29 uh shohei otani randy rosarena matt olson freddie freeman adolis garcia teoscar hernandez Devers, mm. Betts, Acuna. That's your top 10. Those are all really good players, right? Like the, you're not telling those guys not to swing in the shadow zone. Of course not. And I think the interesting, 30 barrels? the interesting thing is if you go a little further down the list, you start to see some other names like Anthony Santander, Jake Berger, Nolan Jones, mm. uh, Spencer Torkelson, Kyle Schwarber's in there, top 15 as well. Jordan is 17th. Jorge so Soler. It, it, it's a little bit of that, that 495 slugging in the shadow zone, right? It's like Okay, if I take, I could get a ball. But if I'm a slugger and I hit this, I could I get like if my slugging percentage is expected is over 500, 
you know, or gets, you know, closer and closer, the closer that gets to one, you know, then I want that base. <laughs> yep. I'd rather have that base. So, yeah, uh, I think the closer your package is towards slugging, the more you want to swing at shadow zone and the closer you are to kind of a slap happy, you know, I think you kind of want to take in the shadow zone. And you uh, you sent me some stuff that, that Dominic had, had tweeted before the show too. It, one of the one of the searches he ran was looking at swing rates with inside the inside the heart of the zone, like pitches that you think guys would be able to crush, right? And the lower rates had some amazing players in it. Bryce Harper was like bottom five in swinging at the heart of the zone, right? So you see, like Elurius Montero was the the, the lowest rate at swinging at pitches in the heart of the zone. I'm like, okay, I guess that that makes sense sort of based on what he's done so far, but he's also a young player. A lot could still change. But yeah, I saw Harper. I saw Shohei Otani pretty high on that list. I'm like, okay, so a, a lot of these swing decisions hinge on who you are as a hitter. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? And probably most specifically, how much power do you have? Like, if you have a lot of power, you can do things a little bit differently than guys who don't. The guys that have kind of average power or below average power probably have to be a lot more selective about what they're trying to do with swings versus takes because their ability to drive pitches is so much more limited by their raw power, their hit tool, their swing path, some combination of those things. Yeah, and I think I think pitch type is a little bit of it too. Um I'm just looking right. here. Like at, a fastball away in the shadow zone for some guys. Like is they love it, or you know, that might be something they like, you know. Like Bo Bichette, I don't know, 17 barrels in the shadow zone. I wonder if a lot of those were like away for him. You know, uh Bryce Harper is increasingly seeing more sliders, right? And he's he just saw a career most sliders last year, 23%. If he's seeing 23% sliders, that means he's seeing sliders in hitters counts. You know, uh, is that right? Yeah. He's seeing sliders and hitters counts when the pitcher is trying to get a strike. Where are they going to throw that slider in the zone? Sometimes they're going to throw that slider middle, middle. Sometimes that slider is still not exactly what Bryce Harper wants. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, but then when you start breaking it down by pitch type, what you end up doing is starting to incorporate, uh, is the batter swinging at things that he can do damage on? So their own personal heat maps, right? And I think that sounds appealing, but I will say that from my history of working with uh, the pitching side of this, Command Plus and Location Plus, Command Plus was this, this stat that we had from Stats Reform where they actually looked, they scouted, and they tried to find an intended zone. They're like, this is how far he was from his intended zone. So they were really looking at how close was the pitcher doing to what he wanted to do specifically that pitcher, you know? And then I ran command plus against location plus, which is just agnostic of the pitcher and the batter and just says, this is where slider should go in this count. This is, these are good places. These are bad places. And location plus had more predictive value. Hmm. The, the one that was agnostic of the very specific intentions of the batter and the pitcher. So I think you do run into, and also like, think about like the life of a hitter you're like, okay, uh, you come up and you have the thing you do great. You do great on Francisco Alvarez. I I I murder low pitches. You know, don't throw me a low pitch, low fastball. I murder those. Right. Well, then you get a steady diet of of high pitches. Right. And one reason I like Alvarez this year is at least high and tight. He's figured out something out. He can actually hit high and tight. And so that's the second iteration of Alvarez. Right. So if you were like. Should Alvarez, if your model is like, should Alvarez swing at high fastballs? <laughs> you know, like, what's your time frame for that? And like, which Alvarez? And right, like for so a while, why. it could be a good idea, but eventually, that might be a bad idea. Yeah, exactly. Like, like what you do I, at twenty three and what you do at thirty could be very different. I was really surprised when I looked at Kyle Schwarber's uh, results on high fastballs. I even talked to him about it where I was like, okay, my narrative is that you came up, you couldn't hit high fastballs. You had to figure out how to hit high fastballs and that, and then you did. And that's sort of been your career has been, you know, bouncing around the, between like having a really good low fastball swing and developing something for high. And he's like, yeah, that's about right. But when I looked at his production on fastballs in the top third of the zone, like there were good years and bad years and they seemed like there was no rhyme to it. And it wasn't like, even when he first came up, it wasn't that bad. So like, uh, 
advanced scouting has got to be one of the hardest things in baseball. That's where you look and you and you go and you watch the player and you come back and you say, this is how we should pitch him. Uh, because that hitter is just cycling through things in his head and he's looking at the same maps that you are. And his hitting coach is saying, man, they're really going to attack you. You know, like we were talking about this with the Dodgers, like somebody was advancing for against the Dodgers and said, every time we advance, like we tell our pitchers what to do, that seems like the hitters know on the Dodgers know what our pitchers are going to do because the Dodgers like advance scout themselves. It's what you should do. And then they, they tell Freddie Freeman, like, if I was pitching to you, I would be throwing you this, this, and this. So I think that's what you'll see today, you know? And then he's like, oh, yeah, he's doing exactly what you... <laughs> it, it's just such a, it's such a simple thing, but it makes so much sense. Like, what, why would you not try to find your own weaknesses? Like, figure out what people are going to do to you and, and yeah. counteract that. Be ready for it. Like, that is, that ex- explains so much about why they are who they are. It's not, it's not the full explanation. But it's just part of it. It's part of their DNA. I, I'm looking at the Bo Bichette heat map for the shadow zone. Yeah, it's all it's low and away. I mean, like he's it's just taking those and serving those into the opposite field. That's what it looks like. Yeah, but yeah. he's still but he's still doing it as a barrel. So oh, it, interesting. It, it kind of makes sense because it's a hit tool, right? So I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna dig more into some of the specifics on this, but I I think hitters are just man. They just have so many things they have to try and figure out. There's, it seems like there are fewer adjustments they can make along the way compared to pitchers. I don't know if that's actually true. It's like maybe a perception thing. The problem is we have so much more data on pitching and so little publicly facing stuff on hitters mm-hmm. and the, the types of adjustments they're making. The, it, even even like the the swing the, like the swing velocity the bat speed stuff is new. We've been teased if we haven't seen it fully. And, and then even, even then, it's like w- w- understanding how how it really works. Interact. Yeah, the bat path. Like I would love to have bat path metrics and, and rawer ones. And then see, that's like down the road, I think we'll be able to do even better stuff with discipline. Because if I could say not this batter specifically, but a batter with this vertical bat angle. Mm-hmm. Now I can say generally they're good in these areas you know what i mean you could sort of account for the shape of their swing but that's out of reach for us right now so right now i think we favor swinging in the heart of the zone and i think we favor not swinging in the shadow zone but it's just a big i think (laughs) so my face got really weird while you were saying that because i remembered something from a few years ago that you wrote about it was a it was about Vlad Jr., who was part of the question from Brendan. And I want to say Dan Acoin, who was at the time at Driveline, is now in the big leagues as a coach with the Phillies, maybe? He's Stop me a, if, I'm, if I've completely director just... Director of R&D for the Phillies. Yes. Okay. It was about attack angle for Vlad Jr., right? Mm-hmm. Something about his swing being kind of flat and not generating enough loft consistently, mm-hmm. right? Is is that the problem more so? Is that still the problem more than the pitches he's hitting? It could be both, but I mm-hmm. think you know if can you if you just change the pitches you swing at, can he can he just unlock more power keeping the swing the same, or does he have to change the swing to get back to that power we saw? Geez, three years ago, four years ago now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's part of it too, because you're you're talking about the shadow zone. We're also talking about the shadow zone as a monolith, right? But the shadow zone is different sections. Yeah, it's shadow zone in high like, and low, low and in and out. Like Isak Paredes, I think he's pretty good on the inside shadow zone. Yeah, and, and, I, and I Vlad actually, we saw from his uh, from his home run derby that he loves it high and tight. Mm-hmm. That's his nuke zone. So you know, if you're talking about shadow swings, like you know, those are some of those are in the shadow, right? You know, but he's nuking them. But again, then you're starting to get into sort of the particulars of any one hitter. Yeah, and you're cutting you're cutting the pie into too many pieces. Happy pie yeah. day, by the way. This is a That's great right. day to get a slice of pie. I, I prefer <laughs> pie the food to pie the number by a healthy healthy margin. <laughs> you can't eat the number. No, you really can't. <laughs> All right, let's get to a few mailbag questions here before we go. This one came from our Discord from uh, Manu Football 022. Is Queen is Quinn Priester 
interesting. And this came after, I believe, his first outing of the spring, which was a good one. He's had a, at least one bumpy one since then. Uh, but the main reason I think this was a question is that there's you know some pedigree there. There's a decent arsenal of pitches, five allegedly, according to the question at least. <laughs> Any interest in him from a deep redraft or dynasty perspective at this point? Because he does seem like he's not discussed as much as you know, Paul Skeens or uh, Jared Jones, especially on this show. I think he's a classic bad fastball guy. And the the way that that works is just that they can become good pitchers. But I think that sometimes it takes longer and it takes great command of a bunch of different pitches and your ceiling isn't as high. You know, it's the, you know, do you want the future Chris Bassett or the future, uh, you know, Garrett Cole question kind of over again. Mm -hmm. um, it's a nice park to do this sort of thing uh, in the spring. He had a 98 stuff plus on his four seam fastball, but he threw four of them in the sample I'm looking at. So this is uh, obviously obfuscated by the fact that it's a small outing. I, I just generally like Jared Jones a lot better. And um, I put Quinn Priester among. So they have these, like the pirates have like a whole rotation of old guys. Hmm. And then a whole rotation of young guys behind them. <laughs> yeah. And if you're talking about the rotation of young guys, I've got Quinn Priester, I guess, second to Jared Jones. Uh, I mean, I or Skeens. So it's a Skeens. Yeah. Skeens, Jones, Priester, Ortiz, Gronzi. I'm kind of, Gronzi's just lost it for me. Uh, but, there's, but there's also like the next wave behind them between Solomedo and Bubba Chandler, too. Right. But I think. I'm just sort of doing the medium term, I guess. Yeah, yeah. So, Looking yeah. more like how they're going to uh, use I'm on the next year. next group. I like Thomas Harrington, but like and Harrington yeah. or something. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> um, uh, so uh, I guess yes, he's interesting because uh, the this this the veterans ahead of them are super boring. I mean, we've got uh, Keller, but then we've got Marco Gonzalez, Martin Perez, uh, Chase Anderson. And there's somebody else too. They signed another person. What do you seen anything on the? They had now? Bailey Falter and Bailey Falter. I'm going to count yeah. him in that in that sort of veteran group. And I like I'm just I, I'm actually kind of thinking that might be the rotation. Oh, they got Lauer too. That's that's and Lauer. Like, so Lauer. that's you know they they're going to take the five veterans and go in. I think and then <sighs> and then sort through those guys, but. Five veterans like that, you're you're gonna get somebody's gonna get hurt. So is Skeens the first guy Reyes. up? Who I, that rotation? Perez, Gonzalez, Falter, Lauer, like teams that are stacked with righties are gonna crush those guys. Oh, I didn't even think of that. In Pittsburgh, I think left field is the harder field. So they're trying to build a rotation that fits their their park. No, I think they're just trying to have enough pitchers to get through the season. <laughs> yeah, like, yes, yeah, I don't. I don't yeah. think this is the secret not, sauce. I think the 3D chess. <laughs> this this is no. That's this is ninety nine cent. But what? How do you? Sauce. How do you? Or <laughs> ninety nine cent. <laughs> the, good, the good stuff is is still to come. They're not. <laughs> they're not trying to trick or deceive or show show us how smart they are with the veterans. They're going to show us how good and smart they are with the next wave that comes up. So is the question like how the Pirates are doing? So let's say the Pirates are doing well and you got your first uh, guy you want to take out of the rotation or is hurt. You know, Lauer just doesn't have it or Gonzalez is hurt or whatever, right? Yeah. Is, if you're if the Pirates are winning, Skeens comes up first. Maybe you even make room for him and you just demote somebody out of that rotation because you didn't. They're all one year deals. You don't care. Yeah. Um, if they're not doing well, is Skeen still the first guy up? Maybe yeah, it's because Priester. Now nah, you're still playing. You're still playing the long game Real with developing. development and trying to get it right for next. That, if, if he's ready, he's ready. I, I think that's that's got to be their mm -hmm. internal philosophy with Skeens, with Jones, with any of those those really. So good Priester ends up being like he's sort of interesting, but he's sort of varied. Even though if you look at Fangraphs, it says Priester is the sixth starter. If you actually kind of run through how this is going to work, I don't think that that actually captures what he is. He's the third young guy. 
behind five veterans, maybe six. They still have Luis Ortiz in there too. Eleven Ks, three earned, I mean, eight innings so walks. far. Uh, five. That's still yeah, still Luis Ortiz. So that's still there. So he's he's kind of part of that mix too. I, mean, I think he's, pretty, he's Priester and Luis Ortiz are like sort of neck and neck. I, I I might put Priester ahead of Ortiz, but you know I don't know that either of them is is making the opening day roster. And I'm increasingly negative about Jared Jones's chance of making the opening day roster. Oh, uh, that's that's a bummer. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks a lot for that question, Manu Football. Let's get to a couple more. This one's from it's Jim on the Discord. Uh, Jim was using the. The, uh, the Fangraphs auction calculator for auto new it spit out projected points for the league setting using the ATC projections. How do you recommend we use the SP ranking within the auction calculator? Oh, that's pretty easy. One thing that um, I try to do, I mean, it's easy, but it's not great. Uh, one thing I can tell you, advanced users um, on the Discord, uh, there was a request for sort of component projections from uh, Stuff Plus, PPRA, and Jordan did that. So if you are an advanced user, you can go on Google Doc and like you can actually get projected, I think like singles, like all that stuff. Like you can get sort of component stuff and build your own kind of projection, um, build your own valuation off of our projections. So that's one answer. For uh, the rest of us, <laughs> um, one thing that I've done is just be like, you know, uh, here are the top 20 starters. You know, Eno's like Eno's got this guy 15th. Let me just look at what the 15th best starter is on the auction calculator. Yeah. Yeah. Cause it's, it's dirty, but like you'll get into an auto new value in auction and you realize that like the auction calculator doesn't prepare you that well for them. It doesn't because the league's pretty different if you're playing the points, especially. It's not a knock on anyone or anything. It's just that. We have so much conversation. There are so many rankings that are based on five by five roto that we're all wired to value the players for that, and we don't make full adjustments to reflect a point and system then, or something that's different. And then the auction calculator is just not that great for auto new because even if you put the players in and it tries to do inflation for you, like the keepers and stuff, you can do that in the auction calculator. Um, like each team is going to have an own their own budget mm -hmm. and so like each there's going to be just these players were like you know i bid like the auction calculator said jack swins who's a minus ten dollar player in my league in my five by five league right and so i was like well i hope to get him for a buck or two i bought him for six i think or seven <laughs> because me and alan harrison both needed outfielders you know and so would, like you end up in these little bidding wars and you're just like, well, this fits my puzzle this way. Now, if this person is starting from scratch, I think this is a better thing to do is just be like, okay, Eno's fifth uh, starting pitcher. Let me just look at the fifth starting pitcher. That's a general value. It doesn't help you with, but Strider and the auction calculator, I agree with Strider. I have him first, the auction calculator him first. There is a big gap there. So you're not running into these big gaps. Once, these, once beyond that, this is just sort of ordered. You know, yeah, sort yeah. Of pitchers ordered by dollars, you know, so you can get a sort of idea of like, okay, this guy should be about 20 bucks because he's the 10th best pitcher and the 10th best pitcher over there is 20 bucks. I would try to blend them a little bit, try to get them side by side and Excel if you can uh, I'd kind of work off of the Eno rankings, but make sure you're adjusting for the settings of auto new accordingly, bumping up guys like Logan Webb, Fromber, assuming that those are the same volume settings guys. that Jim's using. Yeah, some of the volume guys are going to pop more in the calculator. Just making sure you're making fine adjustments based on the big differences. Then, that would be the important thing. The last thing about Odd New is it's a 12 team league. So you kind of like the auction calculator will like will look at that and be like, oh, you know, there's all the like there's only this many pitchers that are that are useful and then the rest are gonna have minuses so you're gonna run into the sawinski problem where you're gonna see a pitcher you like and he's gonna be minus three dollars on the auction calculator and you will buy him for three dollars you know or five dollars and it'll be okay because you have a long bench in auto new and you can actually cycle those guys it's a daily league you can cycle those guys in so my general strategy for building your staff would be to have a couple twenty dollar guys maybe a couple ten dollar guys and then you know have a long tail of kind of two to five dollar guys because you're going to get a lot of mix and match opportunity and a lot of stuff you can do there uh to maximize your points because you will have a limit on how many starts you can do for the week but you can play around with which starts you want 
Yeah, really well said. So hopefully that is helpful for anybody out there in a situation like the one that Jim described. Thanks for that question, Jim. Thanks for the question, Manu Football. And thanks for the big question from Brendan, too. That gave us a lot to chew on on this episode. Uh, as we go, a reminder, you can get a subscription to The Athletic. It should be $2 a month for the first year at theathletic.com slash rates and barrels. Be sure to get in. We're only two weeks away from full opening day, and we're less than a week away from the opening series in Korea, which means we're less than a week away from our two live episodes at Other Half Brewing, the Domino Park location. Sounds like a 6.30 start time for the pod is now what we're landing on. It's, it's been written in pencil. We're going to write over it. And- Be there by 6. We're going to start the games at 3, you know, and just have the the soul games on in the background, meet and greet, uh, and, and hang out. And then as those end, uh, we'll transition to having the pod. So there you go. So I guess some of it depends on how long those games actually are in there rebroadcasted form too since those will be uh replayed from 6 a.m eastern first pitch and we've got um uh nick pollock on wednesday and mike petriello on thursday as the as the guests for our pods so those very are cool fun. looking forward to both of those shows and meeting a lot of you out there at other half in about a week as we go, a couple reminders here. You know, on Twitter at Eno Saris, I'm at Derek Van Iper. You can find the pod at Rates and Barrels. And again, join the Discord. You can find the link for the Listener League. We're on to Listener League number three, thanks to our friends over at Fantrax. 200 people in each league so far. Hopefully, we can fill a third one. I think that would be awesome. That's going to do it for this episode of Rates and Barrels. I We're back over there you on the YouTube page at one o'clock Eastern on Friday. Thanks for listening.